Good afternoon, evening, morning, whatever. You know, one of these times I'm going to get this right. I'm going to just stick with the time of day. And that's the time of day that y'all are going to have to watch this. So sucks to be you, but oh well. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm Johnny Slick. Uh, as you can see, this is Baldur's Gate. This is actually uh, Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2, the Baldur's Gate trilogy mod. Um, if you saw episode zero, which is a good hour and a half long, uh, you will see how I uh, went in there and rather exhaustively, as you could imagine with the length, um, went in and you know chose all the tweaks and mods that I wanted to put on this. Uh, but the big thing that I'm putting in here is uh, Baldur's Gate Trilogy, which is, uh, as you can see, is way basically you start with Baldur's Gate and you keep playing to Baldur's Gate uh, 2. Now, one thing to watch out for when you do do this, when you uh, create your game, you do have to initially... Uh, you know, get both Baldur's Gate 1 and Baldur's Gate 2 loaded onto your PC. But as I mentioned in episode zero, once you get this, uh, you never use the Baldur's Gate 1 ever again. So you can literally delete Baldur's Gate 1 from your hard drive if it's, you know, bugging you or, you know, you don't want the two gig gigabytes of space that it takes up. You know, whatever, you can get rid of it. It, it literally copies all the information from there uh, into Baldur's Gate 2, the, the, that folder, and uses it from there. So that's the big thing that you want to watch out for. So once you do that, uh, you will get to this main screen. Uh, whoops, let's go back so you can see it again. So you do have the choice of playing either Baldur's Gate or Throne of Baal. Throne of Baal is actually the expansion to Baldur's Gate 2. There's no reason why you'd want to do that. It's just there because um, it has to be, basically. I mean, it's this is what the original thing looks like. This button's just replaced by a link to the original Baldur's Gate instead of Baldur's Gate 2. Um, otherwise, you can see all the assets are basically the same. Um, so um, it explains stuff. You can completely ignore that. So we're going to start a single player campaign. It is possible to play multiplayer. To be honest, um, I don't think Baldur's Gate is the greatest game to play in multiplayer. Um, I think you'll see why as we play it. Uh, it is certainly playable. It's a little, if you play it a multiplayer, especially you can get six people in the party and that's okay. It becomes a little bit like Diablo, uh, like a multiplayer Diablo thing, only maybe not as hard. A um, little bit trickier too because the game does sit on the Dungeons and Dragons engine and again we'll see exactly how it does that as the uh, we progress into it. So anyway, so I'm going to start a new game here. Uh, new game. And there we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and choose. So you can be man or woman. It makes no difference. It's top down. So to be honest, one of the things that I end up doing is pick a lady so that I can look at a lady's rear end in like Skyrim. But... <laughs> That perverted creepiness aside, there's no reason why you gotta choose between the one or the other. Um, so yeah, you choose your guy. Portrait is a hundred percent, um, one hundred percent cosmetic. I mean, it's just you know what you're gonna look at for a few hours. You know when you play it. That, by the way, is Adamin. I think I mentioned him in number one. Uh, you can see he's like happy cleric man. Um, I'm trying to think of what kind of. I think I want to do. So Minsk is a ranger, so hey, you can do half works. Uh, so doing a ranger might not be the best idea. That's Minsk, by the way. The finest character in every game ever made. It's my opinion, and my opinion holds. Um, it's, uh, actually, that is a guy who doesn't show up until Baldur's Gate 2, but he's there. Um, that's the guy that I usually end up taking. I think he's actually a dude in the game, but when you get it, when you use a portrait, it'll switch out to a different portrait um, for that player, for that uh, NPC that you find. So you're not like running into clones or anything. I'm going to choose human. Um, you can choose uh, any of these races. Actually, I'm going to quickly go over the, the races here. Uh, this is basically episode zero, which I guess makes the other one episode negative one. I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so humans are, you know, is it all these games? Uh, humans are the default, you know, the vanilla class uh, in Dungeons and Dragons in general. It'd be really, really cool to make a game where humans like are the weirdos, and there's like some other like base class, like amoeba people or something that you know is is you know is like zeros to everything, um, but no disadvantages. Um, but you know, it, this isn't the game that does that. It's based on D and D, which doesn't do that either. D D of course is based uh, more or less on um, 
the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So, uh, in particular, I mean, there's a lot of games, a lot of uh, books that it's based on, but uh, like the uh, Fawford and Grey Mauser series uh, from Lankmar um, by Fritz Lieber. Um, there's a another series that came out way back when called uh, the main character is. God, it's called uh, the first book in the series is called Lord Fowl's Bane, which is about a leper who. Uh, it's been a while since I've read these books, but uh, it's about a leper who kind of trips out and goes to a, uh, a alternate medieval universe where he is uh, kind of idolized. He's not a very nice guy, but hey, he's a leper in real life, so he can mistreat people. Um, you know, there's also. Uh, Game of Thrones, I think, you know, takes many of the same um, means that people, you know, have reused for other games. I think D&D tends to be a lot lighter than Game of Thrones, but there it is. Uh, but yeah, that's the general thing of what you're getting at. Um, this, so it's basically, it's based on really Tolkien's interpretation of medieval history, which is in turn, you know, based on a very specific reading of like how peasants would look in medieval times. And I semi-apologize that I'm getting nerdy on you, but I'm sorry, guys. I'm a big time like medieval history kind of nerd. I mean, that's like, I mean, I have an English major is my my degree, but medieval history is kind of like my thing, like above and beyond anything else. So anyway, so we'll go on here. So um, uh, yeah, humans, the vault race, um, elves are. You know, elves. I mean, you've seen elves all around. Uh, these the D&D elves uh, are a little bit like tall, the taller and thinner uh, elf type uh, that are, you know, they live among the fey people, and they they are better at spell casting. But and they talk about they concern themselves with natural beauty, dancing, frolicking, and other similar pursuits. Um, they live really, really long. Um, I think they're a bit lighter than like the Tolkien elves. The Tolkien elves, you know, there's kind of this general sadness about them because they live forever and they see everybody die around them. I don't think you really get this so much in D&D, &D, um, but you, you could always add that if you're playing the game, you know, playing a thing yourself. Um, in this uh, game, you know, basically the uh, deal here is, is that they get a plus to their dexterity, they get a minus to their constitution, and they're basically good at magic. They also get uh, some bonuses to avoid being um, affected by some spells like I believe sleep and charm also believe uh, that they have some infravision which allows them to see at night so it's often really good to have an elf in your party and like have them scout out ahead of you but um one of the cool things about Baldur's Gate is that uh, you have uh, that you get a bunch of like heroes you can go in and choose from and you know, and have different guys join your party and see, you know, how you want to put stuff together. Uh, they're all, you know, they're all pre-made, but that's actually kind of cool because, again, I think I mentioned this. In fact, I know I mentioned this in, in episode negative one. The real place where Baldur's Gate shines is that all these characters have their own little backstories that you can read through for lore's sake, but that also impacts the game itself. There's, there's especially in Baldur's Gate 2, but to a large extent in Baldur's Gate 1 as well, They've all got like their little things that they're doing uh, that they they want to get done to help their people, help their cause, etc. Um, the game is just it's so good with that. It, it's amazing because this game you know came out in the late '90s, and to my mind, there's been no game that's come anywhere close to providing this amount of characterization and backstory. And, and all that. I mean, Dragon Age came was kind of close. Dragon Age is really, really similar to this, by the way. I think, I think basically you can look at Dragon Age as kind of Baldur's Gate three almost. Um, but Dragon Age doesn't do it to the extent that Baldur's Gate does, in my opinion. No offense. And then on top of that, uh, the um, the the tactics engine is is again it's based on D and D second edition, which is really awesome. Um, so what was I saying? I was talking about the elves. Uh, so yeah, that's elves. Uh, so they get that. Um, you can see that there's uh, some racial divisions of elves. In fact, let's go in here and um, see, just for example, I can take an elf. So one of the big advantages of why you might want to take a non-human character is that you can multi-class that guy. So multi-classing means basically that you can, you when you get uh, your character, you... Uh, level up and spend experience points in them uh, both at the same time. There's advantages and disadvantages to this. The big advantage is with a human when uh, what you can do um, with a human instead of 
uh, multi-classing like this is you can uh, do what they call dual classing. So basically, um, I could take my character and level him up a couple levels of Thief and then move over to, uh, let's say, Magic User. Actually, that's something that a lot of people do with one of the characters in the game, as we'll see. So you can do that. So the downside of doing that is that you level up those couple levels of Thief and you know, you're spending all your experience points all go into Thief. But then when you go to Magic User, you can't use your Thief levels anymore until you exceed those levels in Magic User. In the original game, that made a huge potential issue that you could get up to like level eight as say a fighter, and if, then you then if you multi-class to Magic User, you literally never get enough experience points to get to the point where you can get to level nine in Magic User, so you can get those fighter levels back. So, you know, basically you just kill your character in the middle of the game and um that's one of the things that the, the uh, modification kind of sort of gets rid of basically the way that it gets rid of it is by um essentially allowing you uh well the original game there was an experience points cap at 161,000 xp which sounds like a really high number but you get like up to like you know the level eight or whatever you know it it doesn't look that high anymore um so what you can um so, so yeah, so I mean, basically, it's still probably a bad idea to, to dual class like that. I mean, if you're going to dual class, it's probably a better idea to, like, get up a couple levels in the one and then, you know, move up in the other and then, you know, take advantage of the fact that you've got a couple that you can do both uh, while you try to level up in Thief again, say, if you're in the Thief Mage thing, and then, you know, keep passing those back and forth between each other. Um, so that's basically what humans can do. Uh, so, yeah, so with... Um, with these guys, though, so that what I was saying, though, is the advantage and disadvantage of these is that they both they level them both at the same time. Advantage of that is that you can use both skills, you know, but you can be both use your thief skills and your fighter skills at the same time if you do fighter thief. The disadvantage of it is that essentially because you're basically splitting your XP half into one and half into the other, you basically level up half as quickly. Um, so, yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, also, you can see that there's several uh, classes that aren't available to elves, and that holds true throughout all of them. Like, uh, you know, elves can be thieves, they can't be bards, they can't be monks, uh, they can't be druids, can't be paladins. Um, so just go over these really quickly. Um, Half-elves are a uh, basically what happens when a, when a mad elf gets together with a woman human, or vice versa, and they make babies. Uh, half elf is what is produced. Um, so the half elf is basically basically is kind of a halfway hybrid. It doesn't get all the cool um, like total almost complete resistance to sleep and charm spells that elves get, but it does, as you can see, have access to a lot more base classes. And like elves, it can multi class actually because of the fact that it gets access to a lot more base classes. I think. I don't think elves can take cleric, for example. A half elf, you can have them do a mage cleric. Um, we'll get to classes here in a moment uh, once we do that. But um, yeah, so you can see that. Going back here again. Uh, let's see, the next group. Next, ah, come on back. There you go. Okay, so then you got gnomes. Gnomes, uh, I will say that in actual, when you're actually playing D&D, like half of these classes are really annoying. I've been in groups where basically everybody was either human or a dwarf because every single other race there's a tendency for some people to want to go around if you're a gnome and be like hello I am Mr. Gnome I'm going to hit you with my illusionist staff obviously you don't have to do that um, gnomes have slice, lively and slight senses of humor you know that often comes out to somebody is acting like a dork with their character even I mean I do find that even well I'll get to doors when I get to doors, but so you can see what uh, you can do there with a the gnome. The big thing about gnomes is that, um, yeah, they, so they, gnomes can actually uh, be a specialist, and the specific kind of specialist they can be is the illusionist. Um, you can see, we'll talk about classes in a second, but um, that is kind of a special thing to gnomes. Um, otherwise, you know, they've got many of the same uh, things, you know, specific classes a lot of times they can't do because they're not really gnomish kind of classes. like. The idea of gnomes going off and becoming monks is kind of weird. Speaking of which, we'll talk about monks in a second. Um, okay, so next we have halflings. If you like The Hobbit, uh, that's Bilbo. The, they, in fact, 
uh, there was, I believe, a lawsuit uh, pushed against Dungeons & Dragons in the early 70s when it first came out that uh, said basically they couldn't use the word Hobbit because uh, that was a Tolkien creation. And the Tolkien estate said, nope, that's our thing. You guys want to use that? You got to pay us royalties. So instead, what they did is they made up this uh, creature called the Halfling. Um, the Halflings, a uh, real D&D, they, they tend not to be used much. Um, in the game Blood Bowl, which is uh, basically, I'll probably play it here at some point, which is basically a kind of like a, like, American football. Actually, it's more of like a British conception of American football, but with uh, the the races of Dungeons and Dragons, essentially. Um, I think it's more Warhammer races, but Warhammer races and D&D races are the same thing, essentially. Um, and like in there, uh, that the halfling race, it, halfling teams are like the, the worst team in the world. In fact, basically, usually in Blood Bowl, what you see is people who choose halfling teams are usually like really good at the game and they're just trying to show everybody up by showing hey i'm so good i can beat you with this crappy player um there's that guy in uh street fighter that's the equivalent of that i can't remember what his name is but whatever um so yeah you see that then finally uh yeah there's dwarves there's two up there's dwarves and half orcs uh dwarves so you'll notice there's no half dwarf um because whatever uh dwarves uh, there's some controversy about dwarves there is there's some people out there that say that they are based, Tolkien based them on Jews, which is suddenly makes the whole thing like feel kind of icky, but there's a lot more out there that says that they're not. So don't worry about that. Essentially dwarves, you know, you've seen dwarves. If you've seen, you know, the Hobbit, they, they have to get the 12 uh, dwarves led by what Snorri Snurlifson or whatever the heck his name is. You know, they go out and they, they love gold. They, they love to drink beer. They're little short guys who are basically really good at fighting. You can see here the classes that they get. They don't get very many. Fighter, cleric, thief, or barbarian. So you can't make a dwarven mage. Um, there is a, a tweak, if you'll remember, that I tried to put in here that allows you to basically use any class race combination, but that tweak uh, failed to install. So maybe you'll have better luck with it than I did. Um, if you're using Windows 7, there's a chance of that. I'm, this is on Windows 8. Uh, so, yeah, but you can't do it. They're in D&D terms. They're dwarven mages. are kind of rare. Uh, finally, there's the half-orc. You will see that orcs are not included in this um, because orcs are supposed to be like this pure race of pure evil. Um, in Tolkien terms, there is some evidence, maybe a little bit better sourced than the dwarf thing, that uh, they are... Were basically an amalgam or an analog rather for uh muslims during medieval time um but yeah there is this general sense you know especially in tolkien and it's this general sense in fantasy and, and, and frankly in medieval history too that you know you're you're right up against the end times and there's these enemies at the gates and those are kind of the orcs and there's a bunch of other you know non-human races out there as well but uh they they did add in dungeons and dragons uh, the, this goes all the way back to AD&D, uh which is first edition still came out in the late 70s uh this is again this game's based on second edition which is very very similar to first but technically is a new edition came out in the early 90s um so half orcs though uh you know are obviously the product of an orc and, and human and so um, they're not very attractive. I think you saw an example of, let's see, uh, let's go back and choose. I think we saw, hey, that's a Monteron, by the way, and that's Czar. Um, where is he? Half orc dude. Oh, yeah, I like that guy. Um, <laughs> that is an elf. You can just see straight up there why a lot of um, American males, maybe on the geeky side, don't want to be reminded of their geekiness by playing a character who looks like that. Ooh. Anyway, um, whereas dwarves, on the other hand, appear to be very popular because I think that's the other thing that like 50% of the people who play the game kind of look like, so I don't know. Um, yeah, where are we? Minsk again. There we go. That's a half orc. You can see, not the most attractive guy in the world to get green skin. Uh, if you were to open his mouth, you'd see like big jagged teeth. Um, anyway, though, I am male. I'm gonna take the 
somewhat American Indian looking guy. 